Good evening, everyone. You're all very welcome to this week's Inspiring Ideas at Trinity webinar with the Trinity Law School titled 100 Days of Brexit. My name is Gareth Crow. I'm Associate Director of Development at Trinity Development Alumni, TDA. Our talk today will last around 35 minutes with Q&A from the audience following that. And we're aiming to finish up at about 7 p.m. Irish time. We really encourage you to submit questions you have for our speakers throughout the webinar by using the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen if you're viewing on Zoom. And if you're viewing on YouTube Live, uh, you're welcome to input questions in the comments box there as well. This webinar is being recorded for later viewing. If you're watching on Zoom, you will get a link to the recording after this webinar. The recording will also be available to view on the TCD Alumni YouTube channel after our live broadcast. Now I'd like to introduce and hand over to our over today's host and MC, Professor Yvonne Scannell. Professor Scannell is an Emeritus Professor in the School of Law. She's one of Europe's foremost experts on environmental and planning law and is a former judge of the European Nuclear Energy Tribunal at the OCED in Paris. Professor Scannell. Good evening, alumni, and fond regards to you all and to um, going to put your questions to the uh, uh, speakers. Now, we have two distinguished speakers this evening. The first is Quivine Mwelon, who is a recently appointed head of our law school. Take a good look at him now, because like Obama, for four years time, you may see a different type of man. And because the law school tends to have a wearying effect on heads. And, our, and Quivin is an expert on food law, a worldwide expert on food law. He's written two books and many articles in distinguished journals on the subject. And he also advises international organizations on it. And our second speaker this evening is Matthew Broadstock. And Matthew is a solicitor. He's a partner with Matson Ormsby and Prentice, one of our leading law firms in Dublin. He's a specialist in VAT and customs and excise and all of those sort of tariffs and taxes that have suddenly become very important in our legal system since Brexit. So then the, our two speakers will be in conversation with each other, but may I start, Quivy, by asking you, what has happened in the last 100 days with regard to food and goods uh, that we, that, since Brexit? Thanks, Yvonne, and good evening, everybody. Uh, I'm going to explain, I suppose, what's happened in relation to Brexit from a personal experience I'm going to call it a tale of two cities, or, or at least two places. And those two places are Belfast and Bray. And the reason why I'm choosing these two places is because in early January, a few days after New Year's Day, I was around in my local supermarket. And I went there for two things in particular, halloumi, which I love, type of cheese from Greece and Cyprus, and my favourite type of orange juice. And I could get neither. On the supermarket shelf, there was an empty space where the halloumi and the orange juice once resided. Now, there were a number of reasons as to why the halloumi and the orange juice were unavailable in this occasion. Uh, one of the reasons, obviously, was the new variant of COVID-19, which stopped trucks at the ports on either side of the channel, the new Kent variant. There was also an increase in flight bans from areas like South Africa and Southern America, and that obviously led to delays in distribution as well of some of these products in relation to the orange juice, for example. There were changes being made by distribution companies, by retailers, by producers in relation to their supply lines in order to be able to grapple with the new challenges that Brexit was posing for them at the earliest possible opportunity. And to my surprise, I've also found out that the popularity of halloumi has increased significantly in recent years. Apparently it's doubling around every eight years and will be worth near a billion US dollars by the year 2028. But in addition to all of these reasons why there were shortages of both halloumi and orange juice, 
is the fact that there was also Brexit. So why did Brexit then have an impact on the halloumi and orange juice supplies? Well, the primary reason obviously is because now Britain, and I'm going to talk about Britain rather than the UK, because in a Brexit context, we are really talking about England, Scotland and Wales because of the Northern Ireland, Ireland protocol. But Britain is now a third country and they now have to deal with a whole set of different legislative requirements that we didn't have to deal with in the past because they have been established as a third country. And also then to a degree, there would be new checks on imports, new regulatory requirements that importers into Ireland from places like the UK would have to deal with. So while I was exercised about my halloumi and my orange juice, up in Belfast, the Minister for Agriculture was exercised about his Sunday roast. Now he acknowledged straight away that they had ample supplies of beef and potatoes produced domestically in Northern Ireland, but he was very concerned about his trifle and his gravy. And he thought that because of Brexit, he wasn't going to be able to get Bisto and he wasn't going to be able to get jelly, in particular after the expiry of the now extended grace period. So by now, by April the 1st, the grace period was supposed to have expired from uh, distribution channels between Britain and Northern Ireland. And he feared that jelly and bistro would not be able to make their way across the Irish Sea. Now that obviously has changed and it's now going to be introduced on a staggered basis over the rest of this year. Uh, but there will be checks between Northern Ireland and Britain. And as a consequence of that, there possibly will be shortages of products like jelly and bisto. And in its most stark way, Brexit has actually led to the introduction of bans. For example, most famously in relation to shellfish. And some shellfish cannot be imported from Britain into the European Union in any circumstances at the moment. There are some exceptions to this. Now, why is all of this important? Other than the fact that I couldn't get a loomy and Edwin Poots was concerned about his gravy, there was also a number of reasons as to why Brexit is really significant for the Irish agri-food sector. We export around five and a half billion euros worth of agri-food products to the UK every year. And the vast majority of this, around 80% of this figure, is directly related to exports to England, Scotland and Wales, around 4.8 billion of this. Around half of our beef exports, we know, all know how important the beef industry is to Ireland, around half of our beef exports, around a million, billion euros worth, are to Britain. Also around a billion euros worth of exports from Ireland to Britain in dairy produce and around 2 billion euros in prepared food. Almost all of our exported mushrooms go to Britain. It's almost exclusively the only overseas market for Irish mushrooms and around two thirds of our poultry meat exports go to Britain as well. Meat and dairy produce, anything coming from animals has been significantly affected by Brexit and will be more significantly affected into the future because of the levels of expense involved, the inconvenience involved, the difficulties involved in relation to some of this. The chair of Marks and Spencers has described some of the rules around Brexit as making unraveling the genome, the genome sim sequence look simple. And that's exactly why Matthew is going to deal with some of the aspects of the formalities and the customs procedures in relation to this, because I can't get my head around an awful lot of them. But suppose, suffice to say at this stage that agri-food has been very significantly affected by Brexit. Around 11% of all of our exports are to Britain, but that increases to 38% of our agri-food exports. So it's disproportionately affected in compared to other sectors of the Irish economy. And this is primarily because Britain is now a third country. And as I hope to get a chance to talk about later on, because of increasing rates of regulatory divergence between a member state of the European Union like Ireland and now a third country like Britain. So that's, I think, encapsulates what I've seen, how Brexit has affected us in the initial 100 days. Things that we like to purchase have become unavailable, in particular in relation to foods and drinks that we like. I'm going to hand over to Matthew now, and I, I'm very interested to hear Matthew's perspective in relation to some of this, because obviously Matthew's in practice. I very much deal with the academic side of things. Um, Matthew deals with the important side of things. So Matthew, what immediate impacts have you seen 
in your practice from a customs perspective and from a formality perspective out of Brexit in the first three months or so of its implementation. Thanks a lot, Quivine. And um, I, I think the immediate impact of your introduction there is to make me fairly hungry. Um, but uh, it has been interesting um, to see the impact uh, over the, the last number of months of Brexit. And at its simplest, it really is the reintroduction of lots of formalities and administration, which many businesses no longer have the institutional knowledge in respect of, particularly when you're looking at businesses which are just trading within the EU. Um, it's perhaps had less of an impact on large multinational groups, which have familiarity with the, um, the various complications that come with trading cross customs borders. But just to kind of set the scene initially, um, obviously pre-1 January this year, trade between the UK or Britain, as you're referring to it, and the EU was very, very straightforward from a customs duty perspective because you simply didn't need to worry about it because um, the best way of thinking about it is the customs union means that effectively for trading goods for customs purposes, the EU is one country, if I can put it that way. So goods that were coming into the EU are subject to customs duty rate, rates, which are determined by the EU. So once you were trading within the EU, you didn't need to worry about that. Now, Ireland, as a relatively small market, was typically treated as kind of an outgrowth of the UK market as regards distribution of goods, et cetera. So we wouldn't have necessarily had, particularly in relation to consumer goods, which we're consuming here in Ireland outside kind of the manufacturing world, we weren't really having to deal with the formalities of importing goods into Ireland and um, the classification of those goods, et cetera. We were typically, I suppose, at the far end of a supply chain where goods, if they came from outside the EU, were being shipped from the UK where they'd been imported in bulk, for example. So large distribution centers in the UK. Um, now, what I've seen over the last three or four months is a lot of businesses, um, I suppose, rushing to catch up with the requirements that they now have to meet, which are really making their lives a lot more complicated because they're used to picking up the phone to their suppliers and saying, can you deliver this tomorrow, please? And that simply hasn't been possible um, since the beginning of the year in a lot of cases. And I, I suppose there's now a lot more forward planning involved and coordination between the different stakeholders in the supply chain. So that's certainly something that we've been asked to get involved in a lot more in practice. Now, you might say, well, wasn't there a deal done? Um, we had the, the, the trade and cooperation agreement, and indeed it was um, very welcome when it was, it was agreed kind of close to the deadline. But in that regard, um, and as I'm sure we'll, we'll discuss later on, the devil's in the detail and it only fixes certain problems. So the first thing that um, I suppose is useful for people to know is that deal in no way gets rid of the administrative headaches and the formalities. So everyone still needs to file their customs declarations, whether they're selling goods going from Ireland to Britain, they have to be imported in Britain and equally vice versa when goods are coming back to Ireland. So the deal doesn't deal with that. Um, what the deal does do is it, um, in many cases, reduces the customs duty rate, so the actual financial fee that has to be paid to bring in those goods to nil. Um, now, even in those cases, um, to get the nil rating, the goods have to originate in the party that is exporting them. So to get the zero rate in importing goods into Ireland when goods are coming from the UK, they have to have originated in the UK. And that is a whole other area um, of kind of complicated case law and specific rules for different goods. You know, looking to the food products you were discussing, it might even be easier for some of those, which is rarely the case for food products, but you can see this is where the ingredients came from and claim origin there. But for complicated manufactured goods, it can get down to the value of specific parts and what's being carried out in different places. So again, something that um, uh, a lot of our clients never really have to turn their mind to is now becoming ever more important. And again, just 
adding some costs there. So everything I suppose I'm listing here is just more and more cost um, within the supply chain, which ultimately we as consumers are probably going to pick up. Um, another thing, um, just, just finally, one of the things that has really jumped out at me is uh, the difficulties. Okay, we're talking about the administration. You have to file an import declaration um, when your goods are arriving into Ireland, for example. But when we previously had customs formalities before the single market came in, we didn't have the advanced supply chains that we have now and the just-in-time supply. And indeed, the expectation that when I order something on a website, I'll get it the next day or a day or perhaps two days later. So another thing that has, I suppose, caused issues is trucks coming from the UK to Ireland, which might be from, you know, large wholesalers or indeed um, large consumer facing businesses online. That truck, as opposed to having three different items on it in large bulk amounts, as perhaps would have been the case decades ago, now has thousands of different products on it. And each of those will have different customs codes and different obligations associated with them. So you have a truck arriving with thousands of declarations. And if one of those raises a red flag, whether it's from a revenue perspective or from a food regulatory perspective, that entire truck is held quite rightly by the authorities in the port, delaying the entire supply chain. So that's another thing that we've seen that it's going to become very difficult for businesses who are sending in three of one item and thousands of other items to do that on an efficient basis. So that's definitely something that we've seen. Now, a lot of the problems I've been outlining are simply as a result of the reimposition of customs formalities that you know, the rules are set down, people knew this was coming and it's really things that are happening in practice. Um, they're an example of the non-tariff barriers that everyone will have heard of um, in the build-up to Brexit. I mean, you mentioned, Quivine, earlier on, kind of regulatory disharmony. And uh, I'm wondering if you have kind of good examples of that, because I, I, I can definitely see those in practice kind of impacting on what I'm advising on from a customs perspective. Yeah, thanks, Matthew. I mean, you, you mentioned briefly there the, the rules of origin. I think that's exactly what the chair of MS was alluding to when he mentioned unraveling the human genome sequence. It's so complicated. What's a transformative process? Where, where has it undergone its last substantial process, all that sort of thing. And exactly. that's the kind of worms that's been opened in relation to that. In relation to regulatory disharmony, I'm gonna, gonna give two examples really. One is sort of a very light example, or certainly an apparently light example, but could, something that could actually have really significant ramifications for producers, retailers, distributors here in Ireland. And then I'm gonna have a, a slightly more extreme example where, effectively the British producers uh, and applicants have been locked out of the EU system because of provisions in current European Union food laws. So for example, let's take something like food labelling. So food labelling in European Union law is regulated by the Food Information Regulation of 2011. Now the UK or Britain has retained the Food Information Regulation, so they're still going to apply it until they change it. Okay, so that apparently should be quite a simple process. They've, you know, had almost 50 years of EU membership. Most of their rules are going to be the same as ours at the moment. And hopefully that will stay, stay the case, but maybe not, and maybe we'll explore that later. So this 2011 regulation sets out a number of compulsory indications that have to appear on the label of all food products. So things that you might take for granted, like the name, the best before date, the list of ingredients, conditions of use, that sort of thing. And these are all contained in Article 9 of the regulation. Now, Article 9 also contains a provision that you must include a name, address and contact details of the producer or seller in the European Union. Now, however, that's a complicated, more complicated where it's actually been produced in a third country, which now Britain is. So you cannot put down British details in relation to that. You also cannot just set up an office in Ireland and put that down, those contact details. You must have put a name and address and it must be a European Union name and address. Okay, so if it's not the producer, then it's the importer. 
And this is a seemingly, you know, not a significant problem. Uh, they allow, for example, for a, a, a temporary period for stickers just to be placed over the old name and address, that sort of thing. Um, but it does have consequences because there's a principle in European food law going right back to the general food law regulation of 2002, that the person with responsibility for ensuring that European food law has been complied with is the food business operator. Who is the food business operator? The person with their name and address on the label. So now we have a situation where you don't, haven't produced the food, you haven't labeled the food, you haven't you know, done these things in relation to the food, but because you are putting down your name and contact details on the labeling of the product, it's your responsibility now as an Irish trader or distributor or processor or packer or whatever it happens to be, to have responsibility for ensuring that all of the areas of EU food law have been complied with when they have to be applied in Ireland. And the flip side of that as well for Irish producers of Irish goods is that from October of next year, English law will change. So now you will have to change your labeling if you're producing goods in Ireland, predominantly for the Irish market, and putting down your Irish contact details, which up until now will have you know, been perfectly acceptable when marketing your product over in Britain. Now you'll have to change the labels for export to the British market. You'll have to put down a UK address. And obviously, again, similarly, an office address won't suffice in circumstances like this. So that's one of, one of the issues. A seemingly fairly innocuous provision of a piece of secondary EU law about putting down your details has now taken on providing a significant role for Irish food business operators because it was their contact details or the contact details of somebody in the European Union, the importer into the European Union, that must now appear on the labeling of that, that product. And there are other examples in relation to this as well. For example, in the past, you could label organic produce as being an EU product, where an organic product is made up of lots of different organic ingredients. Now, if some of those ingredients are coming from Britain, you cannot label now that as an EU product anymore. It'll have to be EU slash non-EU or EU slash non-EU slash UK or something like that or even worse, EU slash non-EU slash UK in brackets NI, okay, when the organic ingredient has come from the north of Ireland. Similarly for honey, most of the honey we buy in Ireland actually in the supermarkets is usually a blend of honeys, and it's much cheaper to source a lot of those honeys from outside of the European Union, so there'll often be a blend of EU and non-EU honeys. That'll also apply now to British honeys as well they won't be able to avail of those opportunities that was provided for in the secondary legislation relating to the honey in the past. They have to develop their own hygiene marks now as well. They're outside the EU system for hygiene marks showing compliance with EU hygiene regulations. Can't use those marks anymore. For eggs, you may notice on eggshells, very faintly, uh, there's always a code. That code means something to food law nerds like me. I can decipher that code, not many people can, but they are outside the code system now as well. Their whole egg standards and production standards now need EU approval, okay, uh, until they develop the, uh, their own and they get um, uh, acceptance of that by the European Union. And until they have that, or if they uh, diverge from that, they may have to label their eggs when they're selling them in European Union member states like Ireland as non-EU standard. It's obviously a turnoff for a consumer who's wary about where their eggs are coming from. And one other brief example to mention in relation to uh, regulatory requirements that exist that are now creating problems in relation to Brexit. In particular, at the moment, for British producers, but it'll also be a problem for Irish producers when Britain gets their house in order in relation to some of these requirements and starts to move away from the European Union requirements that they have retained. In many areas of EU food law, in order to get your product onto the market, you have to first get an authorization for that product like a novel food or a genetically modified food or a food containing genetically modified ingredients. Or if you want to make a nutrition claim or a health claim or your, about your product, or you want to market mineral waters or things with added vitamins and minerals, you have to get an authorization. Who do you get that authorization through? You get it by making an application to the competent authority in your member state, usually like someone like the Department of Agriculture in Ireland or the Food Safety Authority of Ireland. 
for third countries, okay, so like Britain now, you have to apply through the competent authority of a member state. So they're effectively locked out. They're now going to have to make their applications for authorizations to get these types of products onto the EU market through the competent authority of another member state. They've lost some control in relation to this. And I say we, I, I suggest that we'll probably lose a similar level of control when they introduce similar regulations on this in, in the coming years. So that, that, that's a few examples that I've seen. So I'm gonna bounce it back to you then, Matthew. Is there any similar concerns from a customs perspective that you've seen? Like how is the EU UK trade and cooperation ag agreement addressed perhaps some of these issues? Sure, no, th thanks a lot, Quivine. And I would say just quickly in response to your point on labeling, that's certainly something that we're seeing in practice with clients. Um, not, not that I'm in the practice of reading kind of the small print in the back of my bottles of wine too often, but the, the, the requirement for the EU importer has led to interesting questions from a customs perspective because there's a similar um, restriction which has caught some say UK producers unawares that when you import goods into the EU, if you are non-EU, you actually have to have an EU party that takes responsibility for the financial liabilities, whether that is VAT or customs duties. So similarly, when they've been looking at the labeling requirements and who is going to take responsibility from a regulatory perspective, that EU legislation speaks to the importer and immediately the question then comes up, well, what does that mean within that EU legislation? And reference is made back to the customs regime, because obviously it is an EU level legislative framework as well, which speaks to who the importer is. And you have quite complicated questions in supply chains regarding tax liabilities and who's entitled to recover tax, whilst also um, being responsible from a regulatory perspective. So it's it's an interesting and um, wonderfully complicated area, unfortunately, for businesses at the moment. And I, I think it's going to take a while to settle down in that regard. Um, coming to your point as to whether there's been kind of similar concerns or uh, unforeseen consequences from a customs perspective of Brexit and indeed the, the trade and cooperation deal. One kind of really good example of how complicated the world has become now is I, I spoke earlier to the principal benefit of the trade and cooperation agreement being the reduction of most customs duties to nil. And that's particularly important for, say, food products, as you mentioned, because there can be very high customs duty rates applicable to them in the EU, so as to encourage kind of domestic consumption within the EU of various products. So it came as a big surprise to many involved in supply chains that when they actually came to apply the TCA, they said, this is great. We can now distribute everything into Ireland and achieve the zero rate. There won't be any financial cost. However, and we referred to this earlier on, that zero rate requires the product to be of the origin of the exporting country. So if you have a UK produced product and it's being shipped to Ireland, the deal solves that problem, you get the zero rate. However, what it does not cover are EU goods, which are shipped to the UK and then shipped to Ireland. So quite often you would have um, supply chains for um, large kind of say food purveyors who would use distribution hubs in the UK to fulfill their stores in Ireland. So. Um, some of the viewers, and indeed yourself, Guivine, may have heard of the Percy Pigs controversy at the beginning of this year. And that, that's exactly, not that we're picking on Marks and Spencers in this conversation, but they've, they've been in the press a lot. Um, this relates to the fact that you have a food product manufactured elsewhere in the EU. Perhaps it's cheaper or it's closer to where kind of the core ingredients are. The, to use Marks and Spencers, Marks and Spencers ship that to the UK. They import it into the UK, so it's exported from the EU, imported into the UK. Nothing is done to that product other than it's stored. Perhaps boxes are split up depending on the amount required for different stores. And then it's put on a truck and sent to Ireland to um, stock, for example, Marks and Spencers on Grafton Street. When that product, which is EU origin, is shipped into Ireland, 
you can now have full customs duties on that and you get no benefit of the zero rate under the trade and cooperation deal. And that came as a big shock to a lot of businesses that would have been hoping that the deal dealt with this. And indeed, in other trade deals, there can be provisions that allow you to trace through. But in this deal, that is not the case. So that's giving rise to big issues that people are now dealing with, again, complicated supply chains that are going to give rise to a lot of costs. And to a degree that was somewhat more unforeseen and difficult to foresee because the deal was done quite so close to um, the Brexit date. Now, a couple of the solutions that we've been seeing, and this might feed into our conversation. Um, one, the, the simplest um, and perhaps most drastic is simply to fulfill Ireland from the EU. So for some products where we're a big enough market, um, and it's not for you know a UK headquarter company. You can simply arrange for the goods to be shipped from the Netherlands directly to Ireland or from France directly to Ireland. And that's why we've seen a lot of pressure on the government, which indeed has been met by the ferry companies, to put a lot more direct shipping capacity between France and Ireland. And that's for one of the, you know, this is one of the reasons that you can now ship goods directly from Ireland without going through the UK. Um, Another solution we're seeing is that people simply pay the customs duty. Yeah. And that is just going to lead to an increase in the cost in the supply chain. Um, we might see consumer prices going up as a result of that. It depends whether the, um, the companies in question decide that's a cost that they're going to have to take out of their profit line or they just could the market take a higher price. So that might feed into a degree into you know, inflation in some goods. And I'm not sure we've seen that fully kind of flow through as yet, particularly because of the COVID restrictions, et cetera. So a lot of retail is not open at the moment. Um, another thing that we have been looking at, and I won't go into detail now, but there's um, very specific reliefs under customs duty, in, including one called returned goods relief. So we've been even examining the possibility that goods shipped from the EU to the UK and then back to Ireland, we can effectively um, say that those are EU goods which are returning to Ireland and in that situation um, customs duty shouldn't arise but again there's yet more administration and evidencing that and tracking that through the supply chain so that's definitely causing issues that are perhaps unforeseen and it's equivalent I think to um, some of the difficulties that, that you were speaking to Quivian as, as regards meeting the um, regulatory requirements and labelling requirements that people are having to adapt on the fly. Um, now, obviously, they haven't been the only changes that have been impacting the UK supply chains, particularly as regards food. Um, as you've mentioned, there's a lot more food rules applying on flows across the Irish Sea now. So uh, I, I've seen a lot of reports um, and concern about the issue of health certificates, and indeed we've seen this sometimes as well. So um, I was just wondering if you've come across those, um, Quivine, as a, as, a, as a food law nerd, and whether you can speak to that in a little more detail. Yeah, these are the export health certificates and obviously these are only applicable now because previously trade between Ireland and Britain was not an export. So the export health certificates have always been required if you're exporting to a third country. Now they're going to obviously be required between trade between Britain and European Union member states like Ireland. So where they are required now in the future for an Irish exporter to Britain, and I'll come on to when they are required in a second, I'll go through this quite quickly. But the Irish exporter, first of all, has to make sure that their business is listed as an approved establishment by the European Union. So they have to do that before they can trade at all where an export health certificate is required. Then the importer in Britain has to notify their authorities about the importation. So there's another layer, yet more administration, as you referred to a minute ago. The Irish exporter then, once those two hurdles have been cleared, gets the export health certificate from the Irish authorities, usually something like a body like the Department of Agriculture. And this export health certificate must accompany the, the goods when they move from Ireland to Britain. Now, the key complication in relation to this is, is that you have different export health certificates for different products, right? It's quite complicated. So a consignment of lots of different products may have to be accompanied by lots of different export health certificates. Right, again, adding to the problems that will be created in trade. Now, hopefully some of these things will be thrashed out before these get to full fruition at a later stage. 
because as things stand, you only need these export health certificates between Ireland and Britain, where the goods are deemed to be high risk. So I mentioned shellfish, for example, earlier. You can only export shellfish, for example, from Britain to any European Union member state where it comes from what are classified as grade A waters, right? So they are very clean waters or where the product has been pre-purified and made ready to eat before exportation. Now, even in those circumstances, uh, an export health certificate is still required, but that's effectively amounted to a prohibition on exports of shellfish from Britain to other EU member states at this stage. Um, in particular, it wouldn't be lucrative enough for them because the pre-purification diminishes the shelf life of the product, and by the time they get to the market, they'd have putrefied. So other high-risk products include things like live animals, germinal products, no, most notably and most reported things like the seed potatoes that we use in our chippers, and some plants as well. Now, from October of this year, this will extend to what we call POAO products, products of animal origin. So any product of animal origin for human consumption will require an export health certificate from the 1st of October of this year. So we're talking about meat, dairy, eggs, fish, honey, composite products, where it's are a mixture of both meat and plant-based products, and again, most famously, sausages. Okay, so these things are going to require export health certificates as well. And then from, it won't be fully implemented until January of next year, where the low risk plant and low risk plant products will be added to the list of products that will have to carry an export health uh, certificate. But all of these products require pre-notification by the importer and the obtain, obtainment and uh, subsequent passing on by the exporter of this export health certificate. And by the end of this process, there's going to be more intense checks taking place when goods are going from Ireland to Britain as well from the 1st of January 2022. Okay, so Matthew, going back to you, um, the issue of these export health certificates is something that will have to be addressed in the short term, but it obviously, as I've alluded to there, it's really still playing out. Are there any other impacts of Brexit that you don't think have fully played out yet from a customs perspective or possibly will have some impact in the future? Sure. Well, I think a lot of this, I mean, I've touched on elements of it already, which is just the difficulties and the friction that people are encountering in their supply chains at the moment. And um, I, I do wonder um, whether the Irish market is perhaps going to have to diverge slightly from the UK market. I've I've often um, jokingly discussed with my wife that um, Irish people are going to have to start dressing more like the French, for example, because we're going to find it easier to get all of our clothing from French websites um, rather than UK websites in future. Because, I mean, I, I know an experience myself um, that uh, even amongst myself and my friends and colleagues, people are a lot more reticent to shop online from certain websites now because of impact when goods arrive along with an extra bill when you thought that you had already paid this. So uh, I think that there is going to be an element of that playing out because that's really consumer driven as to whether people will, I mean, it's been publicized, you know, Amazon are clearly looking to be able to distribute from Ireland as opposed to from the UK, for example. So people might go back to their normal shopping habits, but I suspect that there, there could be some impact there and um, favoring um, EU suppliers. So similar to your food point that people like to know where their eggs are coming from, maybe people will be looking towards specifically where the website they're buying from is from. Um, I think uh, another thing that we haven't yet seen is it's going to have a bit of an impact for us as consumers again on returning goods and having repairs to those goods because we're already seeing queries around that from clients about how to deal with returns and repairs, et cetera. Because again, pre-Brexit, a lot of this was done in the UK because Ireland combined with the UK market was big enough to sustain whatever returns or repair center you would need. However, now that they're outside the customs union, if you have goods which you're returning or sending back to the UK for repair or indeed are coming from the UK back to here, you have so much more administration, importation, even if you find a way around having to pay the customs duty, 
there's a lot of documentation that has to go with the goods coming in. So we may well see things like um, repairs and returns being carried out. I've seen, you know, clients looking to re repair things rather than being repaired in Manchester, they're going to be sent to Spain to be repaired. And we're not going to have as, um, as quick a response. So we're moving back a couple of years, I think, from what we were used to, which is kind of next day and things being done immediately. Um, I also think that um, there is a risk that we here in Ireland simply mightn't get some goods any longer because speaking to your kind of regulatory divergence points um, and indeed the, the difficulties in importing goods here, um, we're not necessarily a big enough market. So if it's something that is primarily a taste of the UK and Ireland or um, a product which is fashionable here at the moment, it may be too expensive simply to distribute it to Ireland. Um, so we may see some less choice in the shops. I do think there's been a delay in some of the impact of Brexit because of the COVID restrictions. Um, so as and when um, we're all allowed out of our houses again and we can go to restaurants and we can go to shops, um, non-essential shops that is, I think that we may start seeing um, whether there's going to be a greater impact and indeed if the delays really feed through, which I suspect may well be the case in, in some areas. So one thing that I was conscious of, Cuivine, was that when we were chatting to each other um, for this evening's event, um, you mentioned uh, a very interesting point. So from my perspective, a lot of the changes that I've been speaking to are kind of really going to the commercial um, and businesses having to work within the rules. But the rules largely were there for people to know about and they're not going to change too much. The, 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 the union customs legislation is kind of um, a relatively set beast. Yeah. So in that regard, you mentioned that, well, actually from a regulatory perspective, the landscape is evolving a lot more and it's going to keep changing. And I think you had some interesting points there as regards issues that are coming down the line. So businesses can adapt to the customs legislation but from a regulatory perspective, it's going to be a little more difficult. Maybe you could briefly outline that because I thought it was particularly interesting. I will. I, I love the idea of us having to dress like the French. They're certainly far more stylish than me. So any, any advice that's coming from France to me on how to dress, I welcome it. Um, I'll just give two very brief examples of concrete examples of where we're likely to see divergence over the coming years in relation to food. The first one is, is that in our efforts in both Britain and Ireland and across Europe, to tackle the obesity crisis, one of the key things that we would look to do to address those concerns is to introduce front of package labels, which clearly indicate to the consumer that they should avoid this product. Now, Britain has been, or the UK has been trying to introduce front of pack labels since 2006. Six months after they introduced their first front of pack label, the traffic light label, we all know, the, the green, amber and red signs on fats and saturates and salt and that sort of thing. Within six months of the Food Standards Agency in the UK introducing their template, there were 14 different schemes in operation in the UK, no two of which are the same and none of which were the same as the FSA template. Why? Because they couldn't enforce it because of European rule, rules on the free movement of goods. Theresa May turns in to this into an argument as to why Brexit could work after the Brexit referendum. We can now do things like this to address a public health crisis. With the most overweight country in the European Union, we can address our problems. Ireland, who is on course to become the most overweight country in Europe by 2030, would be subject to obviously still to EU rules in this area. Despite heavy lobbying in this area for the past 15 years or so to introduce a harmonized front of pack label on food products across the European Union member states, which didn't happen when the Food Information Regulation was introduced in 2011. In 2020, the Commission has published a document suggesting that they are now ready to introduce a harmonised standard across the European Union. And that harmonised standard is likely to be based upon the French Nutri-Score system. So they're two completely different systems. And if, I've, if there's something comes up in the questions and answers, I'll share some examples of this later on. So there's the UK standard, which is based on the individual components or individual nutrients in a product. And then there's the Nutri-Score in France where it's A, B, C, D, E. And if it's A, it's good, you should have this. And if it's E, it's possibly bad. 
and it's based on an algorithm and more scientifically based and it's much more difficult to come up with that one grading for an overall product. So we're likely for the first time to see mandatory front of, front of pack labels introduced both in Britain and in the European Union, but they're going in opposite directions. So the Irish producer exporting to the European to, to Britain now has to comply with the Irish standard and the British standard and invest significant for a small and medium sized enterprise in the science behind evaluating and proving what they're saying on this front of pack of lab label can be verified. And very briefly, the last example is in relation to animal welfare. So Ireland does big trade in the exportation of live animals. Britain doesn't do much. And as a consequence of this, and following on from the Conservative Party's manifesto before the last general election, they are looking to ban the transportation of live animals for fattening or slaughter. And they're also looking to introduce a number of other provisions in relation to this as well, changing the sizes of the vehicles that they are transported in to give them more headroom, uh, regulating temperatures in these vehicles more closely, shortening journey times, more rests, that sort of thing. So actually, for Ireland, a country who does nearly half a billion euros worth of trade in live animal exports every year, the land bridge through Britain might be cut off. And this is another area where we could see divergence in, in, in future years. There's lots of more examples, but that's two that I would put to you now and very much we'll watch this space. And over time, things are likely to diverge, diverge more and more. There are hundreds and hundreds of delegated acts in relation to food introduced by the European Union every year as well. And that's going to increase divergence too. Thanks. Thank you, Quivin. Now, I have a few questions here from members of the audience. The first one is really interesting in practical terms. It says, this person lives in the UK and in Ireland, and she gets charged import duties importing from the EU in England, and, and also in Ireland, but not consistently in Ireland. And she said, for the duty-free airports, there's no duty-free exiting from the UK, but there is exiting from Ireland. Why is there this inconsistent approach? And does Matthew know what's happening there? So um, it's, it's an interesting question, I suppose. On, on the first element of it about um, having to pay import duties when you arrive in Ireland, um, I think an interesting point to make there is that there's always been a degree of inconsistency in its application for private individuals. And the example I would give is people go on, um, going on shopping weekends to New York, which was obviously historically, you know, a, a, a big thing, say during the boom, people would be going over with empty suitcases and coming home with full suitcases. Mm -hmm. um, technically, all of those goods should be declared for import and customs duties paid along with VAT on them. And it was really a question of enforcement as to whether um, customs officers were going to pull you aside as you were going through the exit. So this is what the channels are in the airport and whether you are actively declaring something. So now when you buy goods in the UK, it should be similar to when you buy them in New York, that you should be, if they are above the relevant thresholds, you should be declaring those and paying the customs duty and VAT. So, you know, there, there may well be an element of cost of enforcement versus the actual money they would be getting. Um, so that might go somewhat to answer the inconsistency on that in that it, it, it really depends on whether you declare them and uh, indeed whether you're pulled over in that regard. Um, yeah. As regards um, duty-free operating from Dublin but not from London, etc. I think this is um, already an example of divergence in that the EU has a, has a system in place for dealing with third countries. So we know if you are traveling to a certain place, you can claim um, duty-free. So if you're flying to America, you could buy your whiskey at all of the various whiskey stands um, duty-free. Um, because you were flying outside the EU and once the UK was outside that you could simply follow that same model whereas for the UK suddenly are they going to say that everything is duty-free bar domestic flights so they don't have to follow EU rules we do so the UK is now non-EU so we have to apply duty-free on trips to the UK whereas there's a little bit more flexibility for the UK now because they're setting their own rules so they can decide well are we going to allow 
duty free on everyone traveling and therefore forego perhaps quite a large amount of duty and excise on you know the drink and cigarettes that people buy in airports. So it's an interesting question, but I think this goes to Quivian's point that we're only perhaps going to see more divergence because now the UK can take perhaps more political decisions in this regard, whereas the EU is a slightly more lumbering beast in that regard. So the rules are perhaps going to remain more stable. Okay. Uh, the next question is very technical. I think it's for you too, but if it isn't, Quivian can answer it. Some of the difficulties seem to be related to trust issues that the EU has with countries outside the common market. And we know that most, if not all, EU standards are based on ISO standards. I'm not sure that's true, but anyway, we also know that the UK and Ireland are signatories to the WTO TBT agreement. And Article 22.4 of that agreement requires countries to use international standards instead of national regulations. Therefore, would ISO 22,000 series of standards have a role here in addressing at least the trustworthiness of food products moving between EU countries and the UK? Yeah, ISO standards do have a role to play. Um, if you take something like, for example, an international organization like the Codex Alimentarius Commission, which is the United Nations Agency run by the Food and Agriculture Organization and the World Health Organization. Where possible, EU standards are based on codex standards. And there's specific mention in some of the, uh, the agreements, post-Brexit agreements of ISO standards being used as a replacement for EU standards for British products, for example, in relation to things like eggs. So definitely ISO standards have a role to play. However, is there a trust issue? There's a trust issue in some areas, I would suggest, but there's a trust issue for very good reasons. And I would also suggest it's more to do, maybe I've mis misinterpreted the question here, more to do with the WTO agreement on the application of sanitary and phytosanitary measures, the SBS agreement, in relation to trust issues than it is to do with TBT. But if you look at those, uh, sorts of disputes that happen at WTO level in relation to trust issues. Let's take something like the use of hormones in meat production, right? Mm -hmm. there's, an, uh, there's a possibility that if the UK starts to go out now and negotiate its own international agreements with places like Brazil and the United States, that they will have to take hormone treated beef and sell it in, in Britain. Mm -hmm. right? So that's a possibility. So the e EU currently bans the use of hormones in uh, beef products like that. Now, when it comes to trying to resolve a dispute like that at WTO level, number one, it rumbles on for years. And number two, they actually just come up with an alternative remedy. They pay compensation or they look for the concession of suspen suspension of concessions in other areas. The hormones ban ha uh, has existed for a long time. It continues to exist. It will continue ex to exist because the WTO provides for alternative dispute resolution mechanisms other than the, the, the withdrawal of the offending measure. So I would argue WTO rules are not even remotely as strong as European Union rules. And if it's a priority for the European Union, it's going to remain. God knows what will happen when the chlorinated chickens get to the market. Yeah, okay, thank you. And this is the last question we have time for. It's, it is, is there any scope for widening the rules of origin, such as in relation to accumulation? Yeah, I, I can jump in on that one, Ivan. Um, the, the rules of origin really form, so this is obviously as we made reference to earlier with the trade and cooperation agreement, um, the deal. They're a matter of negotiation between the two entities which are entering into the trade deal. So yes, I would say that there's always scope for being able to amend those um, rules of origin. However, the question is whether there would be the political will. So at the moment, um, if particular issues arise, maybe the EU and UK would sit down again, but I think um, we've all lived through the negotiations and how painful they were and the trouble that there is still arising in just implementing the deal as it stands. So there's certainly a question there as to whether there'd be the political will. And I think what always needs to be borne in mind as well is that um, the EU 
is always seeking to do trade deals with others. And in that context, they can't be seen to give something particularly preferential to the UK, which can then be held up um, in other trade deals. So, uh, and we saw this in practice with the UK trade deal itself, because it was always conversations of it being a Canada style deal or you know, comparing it to different regions, whether it should be an Australia style deal, which was no deal. Um, it, it's, um, something that the EU is, I think, always particularly conscious of, that they can't be seen to give something too preferential because then their feet will be held to the fire in later negotiations. So I think we have an interesting um, time ahead of us. Yeah. Thank you very much, Creveen and Matthew. And thank you all for listening in. I hand over to Gareth to say goodbye. Thank you, Yvonne, and a particular thanks uh, to Matthew Broadstock uh, from Matheson and to our own professors, Cleveland McMillan and Yvonne Scannell, but particularly thank you all, uh, our community of alumni, for, for joining us this evening in the first of our series of four uh, spring series of lectures. Next week at six o'clock, we have another, uh, another very interesting uh, topic uh, to discuss, that's assessing the future of Irish defamation law with Professor Neville Cox in conversation with Mr. Owen McCullough, Senior Counsel, and Mr. Kenan Furlong of Anal Good Body. So I do hope you'll join us next week uh, at six o'clock and thank you all again for your attendance. Good evening.